So, so my name is Amy Lo. I'm the head of the Department of Economics here at Oxford. It is my enormous pleasure tonight to introduce Professor Joe Stiglitz, who are very lucky to have visiting the department for the next few weeks as the Sanjay Lala visiting fellow in economics. I think it's fair to say Joe truly needs no introduction, and I'm not going to try to go through his many achievements. Before I ask him to speak, though, I want to say a few words about where I see Joe's agenda fitting in the wider direction of where economics is going, and how I see that fitting into a bit of what we're doing in trying to do here in, in Oxford. Now, the background to this is that Joe's work on micro theory in the 1970s and 80s, it provided the kind of key foundations for how economics approach many issues, issues of insurance and sensitive fronts. To be frank, it's a truly staggering record of a contribution to uh, economics. But what's interesting is what Joe did after that, which is he moved to thinking about how economics can be used to think of key problems in society. He had various policy roles in the, uh, with, with Clinton in particular and with the World Bank, and subsequently has been very involved in policy debates. What I want to stress is what this is. This is an agenda of showing that economics provides crucial insights. But those insights need to be grounded in real world problems and the way people actually behave. Also, he stressed there's good economics and there's bad economics. And I think we have to be aware of where economics works and where it doesn't work. And that requires a bit of, of, of humility. But this is what I want to stress to graduate students who are here today. The girls' career is a real lesson in how to use economics to think about societal problems. It's not an abstract sort of concepts in the end, it's about how we actually address the issues of life and and he's done this from an understanding, a real understanding of economic theory and taking the best bits of economics. As I said, he's not afraid to say which bits of economics he thinks don't work. And whether we agree with him or not, it provides a framework for having a discussion. And I think that's what's so powerful about what we do and what our kind of our, our, our approach is. In my mind, it's very close to what we're trying to build here in, 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 in Oxford, in economics of Oxford. <laughs> We want to train economists, but not just do economics, but to think about how economics can be used to think about those problems in society. And what that means is we've got to be very self-critical. We've got to be questioning the answers we come up with. We've got to criticize what we're coming up with ourselves. We've got to criticize our supervisors. That's the way in which we move forwards. And that's what we're trying to build. And I think it's very much tied to a lot of uh, Joe's, Joe's agenda. And I think, to be honest, this is what the heart of what you brought to this debate about economics and about where economics should be going. It's forcing us to question what we do, think about what the good bits are, what the bad bits are, and take that forward. So, for me, it's why it's so exciting to have Joe talk to us tonight. What he's going to do is he's going to talk to us for about 40 minutes, 45, 45 minutes, and then we'll have about a 40 minute question and answer. Um, so, please hold your questions until the end, and then we'll, we'll have a moderated discussion at the end of the, the lecture. That's all for me. I'd like to ask you to join me. Welcome, Professor Joe Stiglitz. Thank you. Well, it's a real pleasure to be here and, and uh, to talk about a topic which I think uh, is uh, very important and uh, maybe uh, initially seem a little strange to have an economist talking about uh, issues like freedom and liberty. But um, as uh, many of you, uh, so as many of you know, uh, may know, economists have long weighed in to uh, the subject of, of uh, freedom and liberty. Um, there are, uh, I hope some of you read some of these things like Mill's uh, famous book on liberty. Um, Friedman uh, wrote two books, uh, Free to Choose and Capitalism and Freedom. And Hayek wrote The Road to Serfdom, uh, where he argued uh, that the welfare state was leading to these dire consequences. In fact, uh, the claim of Hayek and freedom uh, was even stronger. Uh, they claimed um, that free markets and free enterprise, and they, they put in the word free all the time, uh, with the best way to promote economic well-being and individual freedom. Uh, they argued uh, further there were moral justifications behind the market-driven distribution, a, a theory of just deserves that I'll come to a little later. 
But even further, they argue that the system of free markets, as they called it, was necessary for political freedom. So in the choice between economic freedom and political freedom, uh, their view, there wasn't any choice. You had to have economic freedom if you were going to have political freedom. Well, the, part of the mo motivation for my uh, thinking about uh, these problems is that the issues of freedom have really moved up front and center in discussions. And in almost all uh, countries, we, we've had a, a, a very active debate about uh, wearing masks. Uh, is the requirement to wear masks an invasion of individual's freedom? And there's been a discussion of the right of uh, vaccination. It does the requirement to get vaccinated uh, infringe on your freedom. Um, and of course, uh, at the international level, the issue of uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine has raised the issue of one country's freedom very much uh, at uh, risk. And uh, in the United States, there's been a, a, a growth uh, in libertarianism, uh, partly reflecting a, a, a lack of trust in government and collective action more generally, and a whole set of debates about, uh, on the one hand, um, should you have uh, uh, the right to carry a gun with all the consequences of that, and on the other, the same people who want to, to ensure that everybody has the right to carry a gun also insist uh, that you not have the right to have an abortion. So there, there are a peculiar set of, of mix of views about what is freedom and, and what is not. So uh, the, uh, part of the motivation uh, of this talk is to help us think through some of the concepts of what do we mean by freedom? Uh, obviously, I'm not going to give a, a, a full articulation, but I'm looking at this very much from an economist's point of view. I want to emphasize that's only part that economists have a very peculiar view with the world. So uh, don't take uh, this answer as the whole answer, but I think it's part of the answer uh, of how, how we ought to be thinking about it. Um, Going back uh, to uh, the claim of Friedman and Hayek, uh, their claims, I think, uh, are wrong. Uh, they've tried to use terms like free markets, free enterprise, uh, to bias the discussion, to say, you know, if you're interested in freedom, you have to have free markets. And I'm going to come in a little few minutes and talk about the major uh, you might say, uh, economic policy agenda of the last 40 years is called neoliberalism. Uh, neo means new, but liberalism was, was all about freeing, liberal, uh, freeing markets, uh, getting rid of regulations. Uh, uh, so it was all an agenda with the word liberalism at the core, at, in the language. Um, but I'm going to try to suggest that it really wasn't about freedom. And in fact, uh, advances in economic theory and experiences with neoliberalism over the past four decades have uh, exposed the limitations in uh, these their claims. And uh, I'm going to try to argue that there is an alternative um, uh, way, set of org organizations, which they don't like, but which I think is the right one, which actually expands freedom. So that's really what I'm going to try to come to. It's an advocacy of a particular an alternative to the unfettered market perspective. So more broadly, uh, the last line in the slide is what I'm all about. It's uh, uh, important for progressives to reclaim uh, the use of the word freedom for their agenda. Um, the right has actually one of the main herald groups in the Republican Party is called the Freedom Caucus. And uh, what they're really trying to do is restrict the freedom uh, of a lot of people. 
So that, that's actually one of the things that uh, we teach in, uh, I, I, uh, I call them teaching public policy school. And one of the things that we teach them is whenever you have an agenda, use the name for it that's just the opposite of what you're doing. Uh, and so labeling uh, themselves the Freedom Caucus is a way for, uh, for, for uh, pushing an agenda that goes uh, actually in, in the opposite uh, direction. So I'm, as I said, we're looking at this very much as a narrow-minded economist. And uh, within that perspective, liberty is, can be thought about as a person's freedom to act. And so what the things that you can do, what we would call the opportunity set, defines your freedom uh, of what uh, your freedom. In other words, um, what you can do the choices that you can make gives uh, defines your opportunity set. You have no choices, then you have no freedom. So uh, any reduction in the scope of action that can be undertaken is, uh, in this sense, uh, a loss of freedom. Um, and uh, from this perspective, the kind of language you use, whether it's uh, a regulation, which might be called coercive, or an incentive, which pushes you in a particular direction. What matters is the set of choices that you have and uh, you deal with those set of choices. Um, and um, uh, I don't wanna say that this is always correct. And uh, in my forthcoming book on the subject, I have a, a large discussion of behavioral economics and behavioral economics, one of the insights is what you call something can make a difference. How you frame it uh, can make a difference. But most of what I'm going to talk about today is within uh, more of a traditional economics perspective. So I want to begin with just a very, very simple idea. For, uh, for any society to function, there must be uh, regulations and some form of collective action. If you want to go back you know, to the Bible, the Ten Commandments were a set of regulations. We didn't call them regulations, but, you know, and I think if, if uh, we started calling them regulations, the Freedom Caucus would be against it. Uh, so, but it is a regulation to say, thou shall not kill. You're not allowed to kill. Thou shall not steal. Um, there are the, 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 you know, all of them, not all of them, most of them are of that kind. Um, but regulations are even more important when we live in a closely integrated, highly interdependent society where what one person does has an effect on others. Uh, a simple example of a very elementary regulation is stoplights. Um, it's a regulation. We don't usually frame it that way, but it says you one side can go first and then the other side goes and then the other, you know, so you, it, it directs who the turns that you take in going through the intersection. And if you didn't have stoplights, you'd have gridlock. So in some sense, that simple regulation makes life so much more livable. You, your cities couldn't function without them. Uh, so what we're talking here about is what economists in our, you know, so prosaic language call externalities. And uh, the way I put it here is that one person's freedom, freedom to do something in the presence of externalities, has the effect of reducing another person's externalities. And so any society has to have some way of negotiating, uh, thinking about how you balance those ex externalities. Uh, I, Isaiah Berlin uh, put it in a, a, a much more beautifully, I thought, freedom for the wolves has often meant death for the sheep. Uh, and that really uh, highlights that uh, the issue of freedom is not an absolute. You have to look at it with respect to how uh, the trade offs. And if you were looking at it from the point of view of the sheep, uh, the freedom of the wolves is not such a great thing. And uh, that's true in uh, many 
of the freedoms that I already talked about. So the right to carry a gun, for instance, which uh, a lot of people on the right uh, feel very strongly about, threatens a, a, another person's right to live. We have had a, a wave of, of mass killings in the United States. And, um, you know, the homicide rate, you know, the death rate among young Americans is higher than in other countries, partly because of the pervasiveness of guns. Uh, I mentioned vaccination and masks before. The right not not to get vaccinated or wear masks threatens the life. Others will right not to get the disease. And in that fundamental sense, even uh, the right to live and the right to glue threats others' right to live in a, a healthy life. Uh, so in each of these instances, there's a trade-off between rights. Uh, and that's, of course, what econ economics always deals with. How do we deal with uh, trade-offs? Now, I think in each of these cases, most would agree on how these liberties would be balanced. And if you thought about it from this perspective, from the economist perspective of trade-offs, you'd say, yeah, it's better, the right to live is more important than the right to carry a gun uh, or the right not to get vaccinated. Um, so, uh, the basic, uh, the point I want to raise is that these kinds of trade-offs are pervasive, um, and an example to illustrate this, uh, has to do with, uh, redistribution. Redistribution is the imposition of a tax on somebody. And you might say very naturally, a libertarian would say that the imposition of this tax on me is a restriction on my right to spend. Uh, you reduce my opportunity set. And that, you know, I, uh, for, there are two points of this. Uh, first, it, they're claiming in some sense that they have a, a, a right to the income that they've earned. It's sort of a moral right to that income, that there's a primacy in some way to that income, that, that uh, taking that away is unjust. Uh, and uh, taxation is coercion. You don't have any choice. You don't do it. Uh, the consequences are severe. They either take the money away from you or they put you in jail. So you don't really have uh, a choice. Um, they um, So, uh, it's very clear uh, uh, that taxation is, in that sense, a restriction on the individual's rights. But on the other hand, the revenue that you get from that taxation can be spent in ways that uh, give it to another poor person, for instance, and that expands his opportunity sex, his freedom. It may enable him to live more closely up to his uh, uh, potential. And so the issue of redistribution of the coercion of taxes is nothing more than the standard one of the, uh, how do you evaluate the trade-offs between one person and another? So you can't claim that in, uh, uh, in any absolute claim that you can't impose redistributive taxes. Uh, it's uh, just again I, uh, can be looked at uh, through this uh, lens of, of trade off. Um, but there's another aspect I want to emphasize, and that is the claim implicit in the libertarian perspective uh, that um, there's something I don't know, sacred about the income that you get in a market income, in a, in a market economy. So, um, uh, and that claim is based on a theory of just deserves that uh, because you worked or because you saved, you want to get that income. Well, um, there are a couple parts to that. One is, first of all, the income that you get depends in part on your assets, your wealth. And uh, your wealth uh, 
may depend in many cases depend on what you inherit. But what if the wealth that you inherit is partly unjust? And that's something that uh, many colleges are now trying to deal with. Uh, but we don't send, tend to think about it ourselves. That a lot of the wealth accumulation in our society is a result of slave trade, trade in opium, most of the large, you know, or exploitation, I'll come to that, you know. So you exploit market power legally or illegally, uh, not only historically, but even today. You know, you talk about, say, Microsoft, uh, Bill Gates, uh, he may have made an important contribution, in, but courts in three continents have said he is engaged in abuse of market power in anti-competitive acts, in exploitation. So, and, and you look at the Rockefeller, same thing. They happen to do a lot of good with their money, but you look at a lot of the wealth and it is either historically or even today associated with not just competitive behavior, but exploitation. So if that wealth is illegitimate, how can the income derived from that wealth be viewed as your right and as an absolute right? But then it's even more uh, 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 complicated because when you think about an individual's income, it's the product of your ownership of assets, which we just questioned, and secondly, the returns on that. The, even in a competitive market, the returns, the general equilibrium, what happens, the, the, the wages and the returns to capital or whatever, depend on the distribution of assets. And so if a lot of the wealth is in the hands of people whose wealth is illegitimate, their demands will determine the returns to different factors the prices of different assets. And that means both the asset distribution and the returns to those assets have no moral legitimacy. And so that means that one can't give any moral legitimacy to incomes, even in, a competitive, in an economy that today is competitive, if there's been exploitation in the past. But it's even more problematic if Today, there's a kind of uh, aspects of exploitation. And one of the things that has become increasingly clear, especially in the American economy, but elsewhere, that the deviations from a competitive economy are of first order importance. That there's a lot of kinds of, of a whole variety, I could give a whole lecture on, on the forms of that exploitation takes, including exploitation that is a little bit more subtle, just that arises from the asymmetries of information, from the fact that some people know more than, than other people. So the um, uh, what this says is that, that uh, uh, you have to really, in the end, think about uh, uh, the valuation of taking money away from one person and giving it to another, not from the perspective of the person has an inviolable claim on that income, but in terms of the trade-offs that I talked about further. There's another aspect of this that I think has not gotten sufficient attention and I've tried to call, uh, uh, talk about in one of my more recent books. And that is that uh, as we teach economics, normally we have demand and supply curves and market equilibrium, competitive market equilibrium seems like just the result of natural law. But in fact, the legal framework very sharply shapes the economy and therefore incomes. So when I say that uh, we have a myriad of laws affecting corporate governance, bankruptcy, uh, labor relations, that decide whether you can 
uh, workers can get together and engage in collective bargaining, how easy it is for them to do that, uh, that affect every aspect uh, of our society. And those laws that shape the economy are in turn shaped by political power. They're, they're, they're a result of political activity. But that means that they too don't necessarily have more legitimacy. If the laws are set by the wealthy to benefit themselves, how can you say that it is uh, uh, unjust uh, or inappropriate to redistribute income that is a result of uh, laws? And in some cases, it's pretty, you know, the laws are pretty terrible. In the United States, for instance, if you get any student debt, you can't discharge that debt even in bankruptcy. Um, and if your parents sign a loan, co-sign a loan, even if you die, the parents are liable. So, uh, you know, this is just one example of, you know, outrageous laws that we have. But you ask, why do we have laws? Well, uh, the market power of banks. Is, uh, and so then you say, well, if, if somebody has an income derived from that, even in a market economy, how do we define the moral legitimacy of that? Now, Friedman and Hayek defended uh, capitalism, unfettered capitalism, uh, or neoliberal capitalism, not just in these moral terms, which I find out uh, argue doesn't have much validity, but also in terms of the fact that it was these markets are efficient. So they're good because they're efficient. And um, the uh, one of the central results of my research, you know, that of a number of other people, is that even competitive markets are essentially never efficient. That, uh, you know, as I, I, I put it, uh, the reason the invisible hand, you know, Adam Smith had this idea of the invisible hand uh, would lead uh, individuals in the pursuit of self-interest to the well-being of society. And that's probably the most influential idea in early economics. And uh, what uh, we showed was the reason that the invisible hand was invisible was that it wasn't there. Um, and so uh, the market, uh, it, in general, does not lead to, as you can say, greater efficient outcomes. There are always government interventions that could improve them. And that's even uh, more true, today. it's also true in Hayek's uh, approach, which was quite different. He, he thought of the world much more from an evolutionary perspective. But there's no teleology in evolution, and you can show that uh, for a whole variety of reasons, the, the outcome of evolutionary processes can be uh, very subpar. So, um, in in some ways, uh, 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 one doesn't shouldn't have to try to explain, uh, justify the argument I just gave about the failure of unfettered markets, uh, all one has to do is look at what's happened um, in the United States, where we have what I would say is insufficiently regulated markets. And so I've just listed some of the terrible things that have happened in uh, recent years. We've had the uh, opioid crisis uh, created by drug companies and uh, um, exploiting those seeking relief from their pain, cigarette companies making addictive illegal products and not telling people, financial companies bringing on the financial crisis that cause so much economic devastation. Uh, there are multiple scams on uh, the uh, elderly and others. Oil and coal, coal companies making billions as they engage in the future of our planet. So the bottom line of this is that any theory of liberty and freedom, such as that of Hayek and Friedman, 
The rest of the contention that markets on their own are efficient and not exploitable obviously rests on a weak lead. Uh, lead. So, um, you know, I could talk about a whole broad uh, other uh, examples of uh, exploitation, understanding the theory behind this. Um, but I want to move on and talk about uh, uh, another set of uh, uh, contexts going beyond just externalities. And these are public good problems um, uh, and coordination problems where you get the seeming anomaly that coercion may be free. Uh, next time is a little but but forcing people to do certain things may expand their opportunity set. Uh, so again, th this is not new. Anybody who works in economics understands this, but the language here I think is important in making people understand that coercion can actually be a good thing. Uh, the idea here is um, very much like uh, 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 the ideas that we've uh, been talking about externalities, when we control externalities, uh, we can all be better off. Um, in the case of public goods, we're talking about goods like basic research, investments in infrastructure, education, and health. And the point is, those investments can expand the opportunity set for everybody, especially when they're public goods like research. You, you learn how to do that. Just think about uh, the public research about what caused COVID-19 and the development of the vaccines. We wouldn't be able, many of us wouldn't be alive. That's expanding our, our opportunity set. But the problem with public goods is what economists call the free rider problem. Everybody would like everybody else to pay for it and then enjoy the benefits. And if you relied on voluntary contributions, the danger is that there would be no, or at least an insufficient supply of public goods. So by forcing everybody to contribute to the financing of the public goods, we get the socially desirable level of public goods and everybody can be better off. So, um, uh, in, in the sense of the economist term of uh, expanding your opportunities get to set what you can do, this kind of coercion, forcing people to pay taxes, can make, in fact, everybody uh, uh, better off. And of course, there are uh, some instances where um, what is needed is coordination, and a minimal amount of coercion can get, a, a, get you a long way. And the obvious example is uh, the side of the road that you drive on. If you didn't coordinate it, driving would be uh, perilous. Uh, some people were driving on the left side, some on the right side. But there are a little bit of coordination that says they pass a law. Sweden is an interesting example. They used to drive on one side and then they changed it to drive on the other because they saved a lot of money not being different from the other countries in Europe. Now they become more different from the UK, but uh, they thought they had more inter interchange with, with Europe. So they changed it and then one, uh, uh, and they had to switch. But you couldn't do that without coordination. But once you switch, and you understand everybody's driving on the left rather than the right, you see your interest in driving right that side. So uh, that's an example uh, of uh, 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 where a little origin can be uh, welfare increasing and sustainable. Um, and then there are a whole set of instances where seemingly non coercive ways. Uh, uh, where there are seemingly non coercive ways of altering behavior. So, this is uh, going into modern behavioral economics. And that explains that 
uh, we have the scope for changing people's beliefs, perceptions, uh, values. So uh, take the issue of whether you litter uh, and you pass a law saying if you litter, you get fined. That's a changing the opportunity set. You can choose to litter, but then you have to pay for it. Okay. It's socially desirable not to have litter. Very unpleasant. But there's another way of stopping people from litter. Parents indoctrinate their children that littering is a really bad thing. It's the right thing to do. Now, in a way, I mean, I, 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 in my book, I, I discussed the issue about should we think about that as coercive or not coercive? Uh, they, having been indoctrinated that littering is a bad thing, don't want to litter. And because they've adopted this, that they've internalized the externality of uh, their effects on others, because they've done it, we don't have to be as ruthless in finding them and and punishing them, we have less need of a legal framework and we can rely more on, on, on norms and self-policing. Well, it's an interesting aspect of running a society of how we can engage in, uh, you might say, other regarding behavior, socialization, and it's what parents do a lot. Traditional economics is not talked about this very much. I mean, because they've begun with the premise that people's preferences, beliefs, are they're born with that and are unalterable. But the fact every parent knows that that's what they spend a lot of their time trying to do, not always successfully, but it's what uh, they at least they they seek to do. Um, so uh, the broader issue. Um, is how do we look at peer pressure and social sanctions? Should we view them as social coercion? Uh, they obviously impose constraints in some sense on what we feel comfortable doing. Um, uh, but um, one of the, the last point I make in the slide is that education and better way to uh, understanding the ways our preferences are shaped and our actions are affected by peer pressure can in this sense be freeing. Uh, it's one of the purposes of a liberal arts education. Um, let me skip because I want to uh, keep time here to uh, so in, in the first part uh, of this talk, what I try to do is to make it clear what uh, uh, how an economist looks at the issue of freedom and how uh, it provides a critique of the libertarian view of freedom and that it suggests that uh, actually some forms of coercion can be expand our opportunity set, actually make us in some ways freer. And in other cases, we have a very difficult problem in our society of balancing one person's freedom for the other with another. But there is no way we can get around this problem. Uh, it is a fundamental problem that we as a society uh, have to face. So in the second part of my talk, what I want to ask is, uh, what kind of society, economic system, is most likely to promote a freer society? Using the word freer in the language, in the meaning that I've put forward. And um, the uh, real point here is, um, uh, Uh, that um, uh, uh, that the neoliberal theory, the kind of theory that Hayek and 
and Friedman amplicator is not a, 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 an organ, a, a way of organizing society, the economy that produces the most freedom for the most individuals, to put it in a very loose way. So um, the uh, one way of, uh, you know, I mentioned before that um, the view of neoliberalism arguing that freeing the economy, stripping away the regulations, reducing the size of the state, giving full reign to unfettered markets uh, has not led to higher growth. Uh, the argument was that crippled down economics would mean that the growth of the economy would benefit everybody. And so the opportunity set of everybody would be increased. So it would be freeing for everybody. But the reality is it hasn't done that. Actually, it's growth was slower, and the benefits of that growth went to a very small fraction. The bottom, you know, the United States is the, you might say, the worst case of what's happened. The real wages at the bottom of the United States are the same as they were 65 years ago. There's been no pay raise in 65 years. And that's, you know, in a, in a, a country that's supposed to be the most successful uh, market economy. So uh, the neoliberal agenda has led, I would argue, to, you know, the freedom of our big corporations to exploit others. So, you know, I mentioned before Friedman's book, Freedom to choose, free to choose. I've said the really correct title of this book is "Free to Exploit," and um, that they the, the, the corporations have used uh, that. And I've argued further that because of these massive failures in the, the ability of the economic system to deliver to large fractions of the population, you know, the sort of the enormous inequality with, you know, virtually all of the gains going to the top 1%, there is a strong sense of disillusionment. And that has been at least contributed largely to the growth of populism in the United States and in many other countries that have followed that model. It's not the only reason that there are other countries, there are other factors contributing to populism, but this is one of the key factors contributing to populism. And then, you know, to mock Hayek, I've said that uh, what Hayek and Friedman did, Friedman did is set us on the road to fascism. And um, uh, I think I by now giving you the view that I don't think their view of the world is correct. Um, and uh, what I try to put forward in uh, another one of my recent books uh, is an idea of what I call progressive capitalism. Um, and that is a, a, a idea is a, 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 there are alternative ways of organizing society that can do a better job of enhancing uh, the freedom of more citizens, um, and uh, it entails a, a, a better balance of market and collective action in the state and other forms of collective action uh, with a, a rich ecology of institutions, including cooperatives and not-for-profits, uh, government provision of goods and what is called the public option, uh, competition to, so to, thinking creatively constantly about different ways of organizing, uh, of organizing the economy, organizing society. So it doesn't begin with a commitment to quote, free enterprise and free markets and say, look, at, we have lots of different problems. Uh, it really was a bad idea to privatize prisons. Uh, that that, that uh, the only thing that came out of that was people that were better trained for torturing in Iraq. Um, the uh, uh, privatization of nursing homes 
leads to exploitation of older people. And you saw in Sweden, one of the reasons they had uh, the, that their uh, 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 COVID-19 policy had such a high death rate was uh, because the old age homes were had been privatized. Um, you get uh, the problems in Chile of uh, the, uh, the privatization uh, and the use of the voucher system in, in education. So, you know, we have a complicated society with very different kinds of products, uh, education, health, old age care. In some of them, private markets are a good solution. But thinking that the same institutional arrangement works well for all of the goods and services uh, that we produce is a mistake. And so uh, what I call for is a, a uh, much richer uh, and more creative way of trying to address uh, the various needs in, in our society. Um, and just a, 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 a little bit of advertising. I think if you ask what is the most successful set of institutions in the United States, I think our education institutions, higher education are among, institutions are among uh, the most successful. And none of them are pri private for profit. Our private, so called private colleges, are not, not for profit foundations, where people, you know, the, the, and the other area, we have great state universities like Berkeley uh, and uh, emblematic of for-profit inst institutions are Trump University, which is, you know, sell only in one thing, uh, exploitation. And some of you may know that, you know, before Trump uh, became president, he had to settle uh, a multi-million dollar suit of the exploitation that he had done uh, as part of the Trump University. So uh, the uh, uh, general point is that doing a better job of reducing negative externalities to better regulation, investing in public goods, and correcting other market failures, you can get both greater efficiency and greater equity, more freedom to choose. And these kinds of problems that I've just described are especially important in the 21st century, where we have a high level of urbanization, where a knowledge economy, where education is more important and for-profit education doesn't work, uh, and uh, where, uh, again, research is more important, a basic research is more important, um, and so uh, there is more important to a whole set of other collective action uh, uh, parts of our society. Um, there's one more thing I want to mention before uh, uh, concluding, um, and it goes back to the point I made that individuals are shaped by our society. You know, that we make, as parents, we put a lot of effort into sh shaping our children, that preferences are not exogenous, but our economic system does have an effect in shaping us. And we can't get away from the fact of asking what kind of society do we want to be. And a for-profit excessively uh, for-profit idea that the pursuit of self-interest is all that matters. We, uh, you know, sort of the, uh, that movie uh, the, where the uh, key point was uh, uh, greed is good. Uh, that leads to people who actually believe that and behave according to that. And there's a whole set of experiments in modern behavioral economics that confirms two things. Uh, the longer you study economics, the more selfish you become. Uh, and uh, bankers are more selfish and more dishonest than ordinary people. And uh, these are uh, uh, you know, aspects of ways the environment that we're embedded in affects who we are. And so 
if we have more cooperative institutions, uh, we are likely to wind up being more cooperative as people. So um, we need to think a lot about how the structure of our economy affects who we are and uh, what kind of society we want to have. So uh, the fire, so just in concluding, uh, what I want to say is that um, uh, with greater investments, including in public goods, individuals' capabilities, better management of negative externalities, better social insurance, stronger social cohesion, progressive capitalism, this alternative to neoliberal unfettered capitalism, I believe can enhance individual freedom far more than the kind of unfettered capitalism that I have freedom advocated and doing a better job of creating a good society. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Joe. So we're going to have questions now. Okay, people can put some of the microphones roaming around. I think before we get or when we find the first questions we want to kick us off with, I think I want to just say one comment, which is, in a way, this is, uh, to me, a classic case of where there's economics being used to frame a debate. And it's not a case of where economics is saying capitalism is great, or capitalism has all the answers. It's saying this is a way for us to use a set of tools for thinking about debate. And then we can use those tools and decide which way we want to go. And then just go down the line and say, well, actually, this is really about what capitalism is doing. It's about rent-seeking behavior. And really about that menacing behavior damages communities. There are other people, I have said, actually capitalism is about innovation. But what we have is we have an ability to have that discussion. And so that's what I just want to say. This kind of this is really about the nature of kind of power of doing economics. And it's because we separate out what we where we're doing things from those conclusions about capitalism. I mean, that's my well, my quick try. And in, in, in my uh, in, in book, I talk about innovation and try to address that issue. About whether capitalism is how good it is for innovation, including the direction of innovation. But it, it, I mean, you're absolutely right. It is about framing the debate. Should we have a lot of questions? We want to right there. All right. If you want to pass the microphone, so I just want. Yeah, you hand up on the next question as well at the same time. Uh, the invite from the Oxford Department of International Development. It's fascinating talk. Um, but I was wondering, there's something implicit in your analysis, and you hinted it by talking about collective action um, and politics, which is power. Because ultimately, it's really sometimes I feel it's not really about a new choice between market and the state or capitalism and social. Because in each case, how power is divided in society can influence both the way the market works. Um, no, you're you're absolutely right, and in fact, part uh, I think of, what I think of as progressive capitalism is structuring society is a complicated system of checks and balances that it's very hard for us at Xandy to think about how we design it. Uh, one of the you know, so in my mind, we have market checking government and government checking market, civil society checking both of them. A lot of this is, is trying to get checks and balances on the abuses of power. Um, one uh, of the aspects of that that I think is particularly important, and maybe some of these, a lot of this reflects my experience as an American, so I'm reflecting a little bit of my, you know, uh, is that money affects political power in the United States a lot. And so uh, if you're going to have, uh, uh, you have this nexus between economics, uh, economic inequality affecting political inequality, creating rules that perpetuate the political inequality and the economic inequality. If you're going to break that nexus, somehow at some moment, and the question is how you do it, some moment you have to have a more egalitarian wealth distribution, not perfectly equal, 
but you can't have the extremes of wealth inequality that we have in the United States. Because I believe that in one way or another, extremes of wealth inequality get translated into political inequality. And so it is, and to put it another way, about the kinds of power relationships that you described. Thank you. Got a question? Yes, hi. Um, thanks for the great talk. Um, so you you kind of put forward this idea of uh, progressive capitalism um, as I, I think my understanding of it would be a mix of you know, capitalism and you know, some kind of more government based social initiatives. Um, and in, in most cases, uh, you know, most people would agree with that. I think you put forward quite a strong case for that, but I think it's almost how I said, um, a bit too easy to just put it forth that way you know, in the sense of. Well, yeah, yeah, we need a bit of this and a bit of that. But what would be your practical framework for implementing that? You know, so, if you look forward, um, you know, private prisons as being you know, an example of a very bad idea of privatization, I think um, most, probably most people here would agree with that. Um, but would, how do you determine that kind of across the state, you know, like a common economy? Well, I mean, I guess there are, uh, there are two questions. Uh, oh, one, I think it's really hard to answer which is how do you go from the current status quo to reform the system and uh and there that there's no easy answer but i'd say there are two things about this um uh one is that uh through discussion with a lot of people i i still believe democratic protests that if you convince enough people that society as a whole can function better in this way. Even a lot of rich people will say, I'd rather live in a society that functions well than in a dysfunctional. And that's why, you know, the major uh, support to you might call left-wing groups, progressive groups in the United States come from rich people who say uh, the direction that we're going in is going to, is not, I don't want to live in that country. So uh, that's one source. Uh, the second um, is um, that, uh, again, we're, we have strong enough democracy that there may be a moment of time where for a variety of reasons, uh, people have a reaction against the right and you the left get in control, they should be ready to, you know, th this is a discussion and dialogue. We are hope that we frame the mind of some of the things that need to be done when the progressives have enough political power to shape them. Now, the second part of your question is what are the specific things? And I think that's very country specific. And what, what I mean by that is, um, for instance, in the United States, we don't have uh national health insurance uh so uh for us uh and we've had a hard time even getting close to that politically uh what has been called the public option what i mentioned is an alternative where you you have publicly provided health care both in competition with the private i think the private is so inefficient that the public will win and we will gravitate. So that's an evolutionary approach and saying, okay, don't take away their, you, you have to, people don't want their current, they love their current healthcare, don't take it away, but then show them that there's an alternative. And that's a more evolutionary way of making this. And now each of the areas I can describe the way, I think we could have a public mortgage system as an option not a compulsory. We already have in the UK and many other countries uh, student loan programs. Uh, Australia has a fantastic student loan program. Uh, the whole country pay, is a, a involved in a student loan, income contingent student loan, and it takes 70 people to manage that whole student loan program. Uh, there's no private sector that can compete. Right, so this is just one comment about, which is the other part of the question is really about the aggregation preferences, which I, I think what's interesting is you think about the political process 
aggregating preferences as a way of adjusting what you're saying. And part of the thing, some of the things we comments you made are really about how that aggregation doesn't work or how that aggregation gets captured. So that's just the kind of little bit of a idea with that. Right, Tom. But you, you talk about public goods like knowledge and then the, the rise of social media, particularly in light of the post dominion age. Don't we have the right to the truth rather than a version of truths and up to have the freedom to choose what truth we believe? Uh, that's a great question. I had uh, planned to have a couple of slides, but I'm very bad at judging time, and I would have needed two hours to give my full lecture. So I'm glad you asked that. First of all, you know, I talked about endogenous preferences about uh, people's shape. Uh, part of that shaping process is done by the media. And uh, the, the one of the in a person we call meta narratives how they what how, what they frame the issue the question is is it about innovation or is it about you know taking away your freedom or you know um, one concern I have is that the control of the media is disproportionately in the United States and many other countries in the rich so they get to shape the public debate. Uh, and so uh, to me, that, that's a, a first concern about how we see the world, which is even deeper than the question of what is the truth? You know, the, the, the very categories that we use to uh, frame our, our understandings. But the second is the one of uh, how do we think about um, mis and disinformation? And this is a topic that's very close to my heart because when I did uh, my original work in this first year, it was about the economics of information. And I didn't think as much as I should have about the disinformation, misinformation. You know, the, the framework I used was one where uh, you told the truth, uh, nothing but the truth, but not necessarily the whole truth. And you try to elicit, you know, uh, from somebody else some information. That was the asymmetries of information. But uh, we had, I wrote a paper about the role of fraud uh, and fraud laws. And that, turned, you know, fraud turned out to be very big in the 2008 crisis. And we have truth and advertising laws. So we have a lot of laws requiring. Truth. Why do we have those laws? Because our society again can't function well without some notion of truth. We 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 it's hard to navigate a world where you have different versions of the truth. Uh, there's another way of looking at it. When people tell persistently an untruth, you know, a lie, it pollutes our information ecosystem. You then have a higher burden of distinguishing between truth and untruth. And that, that that's very costly. So I think <clears throat> we do need ways of think of, of, of addressing the problem of mis and disinformation. Now the problem, the, the issue in our democracies is how do, you, how do you square that with free speech? Well, we've always, made trade-offs as I, I don't want to get there. We, we said we've never been absolutist in free speech as I say you can't you can't engage in misleading advertising uh porno child pornography we don't allow you can't cry fire in a crowded theater so we've always made societal judgments and what I would argue is that the spread of the social media has changed the balance of how we make those decisions. So uh, there's an important uh, case coming up uh, in the Supreme Court about uh, uh, the role of social media in editorializing. And um, um, uh, to me, the bottom line of all this is that it's a the way we balance it has changed. 
we can affect things like virality. Uh, the French did that um, in an important way in the election uh, of Macron, where they said they just slowed down uh, falsehood five days before the election. They said, you know, it's not an infringe, much of an infringement on your right uh, to free speech if you wait five days to tell a lie. Um, so there are lots of things. I think it's one of the most important questions our society is going to have to face is how do we reframe the question? You know, free speech as an important value, but not absolutist versus the other, uh, versus the dangers, uh, all the social costs, uh, incitement, uh, social uh, dissension, uh, you know, uh, of, of, uh, of what goes on in, you know, in the act anti-vax movement. Uh, where people were dying because people were encouraged not to get a vaccine, that you got a metal chip uh, in you when you got your vaccine. I mean, just stuff that is clearly lies, you know, not, not even a gray area. And much of life is gray, but they, they've done things that are over the gray area. So the bottom line, I think this is going to be a very important uh, area. And uh, with the Dominion case showed is that um, you can still be uh, uh, subject to libel in, in the case of extreme case, but in general, um, the intermediate, the, the um, social media have been free from any sense of liability from what they did in the United States under uh, uh, a provision that was passed in a law on a totally different topic in 1995 when I was in the Clinton administration. And it was put in there, this is an example of power, it was put in the legislation when nobody was noticing by Google and uh, Facebook. And you would have thought an important provision like that would get some discussion inside the White House. There was no discussion that I know of on this really important provision. It was just shoved in, middle of night, nobody knew it, and now we have to deal with the consequence. John, I'm going to, ask, I'm going to push you a bit on questions because we're going to run out of time. There's so many questions coming out. Um, but one of the things No, 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 that was really interesting. But it's a good question. Um, thank you for the lecture. Uh, my name is Simon Selscombe. I did the M film economics here. And I'm actually from Sweden. Um, and so one of the things that you talked about relates a little bit to what's called status individualism. Um, I think that's probably partially why Sweden has now among the most um, billionaires per capita in the world. But my question relates to something else, uh, relates to credit creation, growth, and the functioning of our global economic system. So I'd just like to hear a bit about your thoughts about the relationship between these. Or is credit creation necessary for growth? Is economic growth continuously necessary for the functioning of our global economic system? Um, okay. Well, um, I I think that we, no growth is not necessary for the functioning of our system, but I think growth is important uh, at this point. The large fractions of the, of the world do not live in poverty, don't have adequate health care. So, and I think we need growth in the form of innovation to uh, make the green transition to break the link between uh, consumption and emissions. So, there are still is a lot of uh, growth that we need, but that doesn't mean it's either necessary or eventually whether uh, we sh yeah, we may not want to. Have. If, we, if we all had a decent standard of living, it's not necessarily the case that we need to have people grow. Right. Question. Thank you, Zana. The Bible and the Real Science. Thank you so much for your talk. My question is more about uh, technology and the effect of um, um, R&D budget. So 
basically there's a lot of funding when it comes to the role in technology readiness that is for government funds and uh, puts in a lot of funds to develop technology at a very nascent stage. Uh, but when it comes to technology moving up the ladder, it goes into the private sector and then companies grow to guys like Google or uh, whether it's Elon Musk or Richard Branson, we want to have our own uh, sets of people. Um, how do we how do we ensure that the technology actually grows and the effects of technology um uh, the positive effects of technology um takes place like for example if you think about nasa and spacex nasa being one of the most important most um top known organizations in the world is still very inefficient compared to what spacex can do uh in terms of producing a rocket so could you please comment on that? How we can limit? Um... Well, I, okay, yeah, there are two or three parts to the question. First, uh, innovation is very effective, and the benefits of innovation are very effective by our intellectual property regime. And uh, the intellectual property regime is one of those rules I talked about that shape our society and are shaped by, in this case, our intellectual property regime. regime were largely shaped by the drug industry and the entertainment industry in the United States. Uh, so, you know, and we have a peculiar law, for instance, that you copyrights go uh, X years beyond uh, death, having to do with Disney, um, uh, Mickey Mouse, we call it the Mickey Mouse provision. Um, anyway, so the point is that. Uh, Innovation is an example where the role of the rules become very important, and those rules have, in fact, been shaped by those with political power. Um, hi, thank you very much for your talk. Um, I felt like throughout the talk, there were some implicit presumptions that were made, and I wanted to hit back on a few of those. Um, primarily, you talk about conceptualizing freedom as something that brings about a maximization of opportunity sets and the trade off and the balancing that comes within this uh, has got leads to overall maximization. Um, I wanted to ask do you feel like at some point it's going to come in conflict with, say, utilitarian view of maximizing utility? And therefore, is there something intrinsically valuable to maximizing opportunity sets when you find freedom? Um, I'm, I'm trying to. So sometimes you're asking what's the difference between maximizing opportunity set and maximizing utility. No, I do not. I don't think you said. I thought you were judging there is an opportunity set, yeah. you could find, and you want to maximize utility given your opportunity set. Yeah, and, and so I didn't, I didn't define how people make choices. What I wanted to say is that if you want to think about what is your freedom to make a choice, it's what you can do, I mean, it's just a very simple idea that that what you can do defines your freedom. If you can't, if you go and do a little bit, then you don't have much freedom. If I make that set of choices bigger in a relevant way, then I'm enhancing your freedom. Though. I guess what I'm asking is, what about that is intrinsically valuable? Why is that the end goal? Because you also talk about rights and use that quite interchangeably, and that seems to speak to human dignity. You talk about external externalities on this side, you've got social insurance. That seems to speak to the idea of safety. So, what is it about maximizing opportunities that and freedom that's intrinsically valuable that you think is worthy of being a goal of governance or the oh, No, it's just I'm looking at one aspect of society which I label freedom, but uh, the, 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 there are other things. So in making the trade-offs that I talked about, you might want to talk about the rights of one person versus the other. That's part of the discussion that might come up in, in the balancing of those trade-offs. I mean, economists don't use the word rights, but other people do, and it, it, it's perfectly legitimate language. But so you might say, in thinking about these, the rights of somebody to live is more important than the right of somebody to carry a gun. That's a, 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 another way of saying the freedom to carry a gun is not as important as the freedom to live. 
We've got about I have two or three more questions. There's a question in there. Uh, yeah, just to come back to make the term a six piece between, say, Friedman and Samuelson, both of the draft, you know, the Vietnam War draft, where Friedman was against the draft and Samuelson supported the draft. Effectively, I think the idea was that you had to share the burden of fighting a war across society. Where would you kind of stand on something like the Vietnam War draft or, or a war on one description? Yeah, that's a really interesting uh, uh, question. Uh, I think, um, I think, you know, in in one sense, uh, you might say if we gave more income to poor people, to the poor people who volunteer in the United States, a lot of the people who are quote volunteering to fight in the war in Vietnam, or not more recently in the war in Iraq, but we had. Uh, were people who, who we took away all their other opportunities. So in the sense, okay, they're they're choosing to risk their life because we've constrained their choice set. And would it be better if we expanded their choice set? So now we have a level playing field and we'll see if, is it just the children of the very poor who volunteer? Or maybe, you know, the, uh, the children of the congressmen volunteer, and that would give you a different view of the nature of the war. So right now we have a mercenary army, uh, really of poor people uh, who have no other opportunity. So that's the way I would try to reframe uh, that choice. Thank you. Question number one. Thank you, Professor Stiglitz. Uh, my name is Asa Bislav. I'm a Rogers Journalist Fellow. Um, building on the idea of other regarding behavior, what role do you think economic finance, which has some common values with ESG-minded investing, what role do you think it might play in addressing the climate crisis? Yeah. Islamic finance. Oh, Islamic finance. Oh, um, well, uh, I think ESG uh, is very important because that's an attempt by uh, investors not to impose externalities. And, uh, you know, this going, going back to Friedman's famous article, he said it was wrong for shareholders to care about, for managers to care about anything other than the shareholders, to be in any way other regarding. And I think, going back to what I said, society is a lot better off if when you have inadequate laws and externalities, you think about climate change. And so, so uh, now Islamic finance um, is a particular, I think the good part of the Islamic finance is that it thinks more about exploitation. I've never been convinced that, you know, modern Islamic finance is, works very hard to get, a, get around uh, the provisions of debt and move it into equity. I'm not sure, you know, from the, the from the point of view of an economist, that shift between debt and equity may or may not be good, desirable. It really depends on the individual, uh, on the circumstances. It changes the exploitation completely, whether it's debt or equity. Yeah. We had one was question was the question there and the last question I was this question was yes. I uh, uh after you did the previous question, you talked a lot about exploitation, and that uh, seems to be the center of your argument about exploitation of wealth accumulation or uh, capitalist system. Could you explain it in a bit more what you mean by that? Like, from my from the economic sense, it seems to me that you mean uh, that using market power is exploitation. Am I right in that understanding? Yeah, that. so I would use no exploitation as a summary of a broad thing. Uh, I'm just sure for you know, like. Uh, rent seeking, uh, which can come from uh, market power, uh, exploit, but I, it also includes exploiting somebody's ignorance uh, or uh, taking advantage of asymmetries of information, uh, the ability of uh, the uh, digital giants to use your information to try to extract as much consumer surplus from you as they can. 
all those are examples of, of ex exploitation. I mean, in, in a sense, I'm using it in a very rough way. Anything you can do that will give you more income than you would have gotten in a competitive equilibrium. Right, this is one last, last question. I was curious about your point on the US Army. So to me, like the US Army provides one of the best ways to exit poverty in America because it guarantees you a paycheck and it gives you the GI Bill once you leave if you're enlisted. Um, you get free health care, your dependents are taken care of, and you also have mentorship from officers. So I was just wondering your opinions on that. Oh, I, I think uh, a lot of what, what uh, the provisions that we've done have been to try to rectify. Uh, the low pay that they get for the risk that they face. Um, the um, if you go back on the GI Bill uh, at the end of World War II, uh, it was marked by a lot of the racial inequities that have been now well documented. Uh, you know, uh, the uh, African Americans were not did not have access. To the same uh, education and, and uh, housing that others did after the war. Uh, but uh, compared to uh, other ways of upward mobility, given the uh, constraints that we had in many parts of the United States, uh, the Army represented a, a greater, greater opportunity. I mean, one of the interesting things I, I uh, saw it even when I was in the government. Uh, they were more committed to equality within the military than other institutions. I mean, they, they were able for upward mobility. But what I'm, I, my answer to the other question is they, were, they wound up there because opportunities elsewhere were so constrained. So, it's a mixed picture. I mean, uh, uh, you know, the generals were, even though many of them came from the South, the institution as a whole was much more committed to welcome mobility, at least to a certain point. It's kind of like second best solution. We're about to wrap it up there on the I think we've got to move ahead on. But please, let me start by um, thank you, Professor Stiglitz, for